Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Smart Human Podcast. Today, I have the pleasure of speaking with my mentor, colleague, and friend, Dr. Tarona Lodog. She is an internationally recognized expert in dietary supplements, herbal medicine, women's health, and integrative medicine. She's also a prolific scholar, having written 50 research articles, 25 chapters for textbooks, and authored several books, including those with for National Geographics. Today, we're talking spirituality, her favorite herbs, integrative versus Western medicine, and so much more. So stay tuned. <laughs> Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Smart Human Podcast. Today, I have the pleasure of talking with my friend, colleague, mentor, and so much more, Dr. Tarona Lodog, who is an internationally recognized expert in dietary supplements, herbal medicine, women's health, and integrative medicine. In addition to her continued work as a clinician and educator, Dr. Lodog has engaged in national health policy and regulatory issues for more than two decades. She is also a prolific scholar. Dr. Lodog has published 50 research articles in medical science journals, written 25 chapters for medical textbooks, and authored four books with National Geographic, and is the co-editor for Integrative Women's Health by Oxford University Press. She's also was a clinical associate, prof clinical associate professor of medicine and fellowship director for the University of Arizona Center for Integrative Medicine, where I had the pleasure of learning from her uh, incredible fountain of wisdom and knowledge. Um, but she's had also lots of uh, awards such as uh, from Time Magazine for Innovator uh, in Complementary and Alternative Medicine, NPR's People's Pharmacy Award, Scripps Lifetime Achievement Award, and also more, more uh, I guess more recently, uh, she is founding director of Medicine Lodge Ranch, a natural medicine academy in Picos, New Mexico. So thank you. I mean, this was an edited version of your bio, by the way, because I once received a 20-page version. Um, but it is an <laughs> honor and exciting to have you here, Dr. Lodog. So thank you. Oh, I'm so happy. I'm so happy to be here with you. And uh, and the honor is all mine. Honor is all mine. It's been wonderful to watch um, to watch you soar and uh, all the work that you're doing. Um, it's just it's important work. And uh, thank you for that. Thank you for for being such an advocate for the environment and for people. Well, thank you. I learned from the best, actually. Um, so I'll get right into it because I really want to learn more. I want the audience to learn more about you and your career and your life and your, um, you know, your loves. Um, just to begin with, tell us a little bit about your journey through different careers, because this is what I found so fascinating when I first met you. Different careers, different modalities of healing. Um, did they shape your kind of approach to medicine, having gone through different types of careers to get to where you are? Mm. Um, well, thank you for that question. Um, so, you know, for me, um, I, I know people think it's fascinating that I've, you know, done these different things in my life, you know, studied midwifery. Um, I loved birth. My great grandmother actually was a midwife in Kansas. So it was like, uh, I always loved hearing stories of her. Um, again, it's such a long time ago. Um, both of my parents were born at home. I mean, so, you know, this this was a natural history for me. And, and, and an interest. I went to massage school um, in the late 1970s, <laughs> which my mother was really concerned about because um, back in those days, there was a lot of like, well, you're not going to massage men, are you? I mean, that was this whole thing about, <laughs> about sort of the sexualization of massage, sure. which is so sad because um, it's such a wonderful healing art, the heart of, you know, the, the, the art of touch uh, and healing touch. I was very interested in herbal medicine. I have been since I was very young. Um, anything to do with nature, I was very interested in. And um, so I, I, I set up a shop in Las Cruces, New Mexico in 1982. And um, I had herbal products, Tarone's Herbals, and um, was my community herbalist. Um, and I, I did all of those things. And I, and I was deeply into martial arts, <laughs> deeply, deeply into martial arts. I love really? Taekwondo. And uh, yep. And so um, when that. I was studying midwifery, 
I was doing Taekwondo and I was, I was running the school. I was not running it as the teacher. I was running it as the front office kind of person, signing people up, ordering the uniforms, cleaning the toilets, you know, doing all of that. I loved it. I eventually earned my third Don or my, my third degree black belt in Taekwondo um, over many, many years, but I, I loved it as well. And all of those things were just, they just informed the way I saw the world. And, um, and, and all of them were about how I could help other people, how I could help other people to feel better and how I could help them to, to partner with them. Actually, I always saw myself as a partner. I've never liked, I'm a caregiver to my family. I'm a care partner to basically everybody else, right? I'm, I'm, I partner with them as they are on their journey of, of trying to find whatever wellness means to them. But I never thought of it as like, I'm a massage therapist or I'm an herbalist or a doctor. Even today, I think of myself as Trone and, 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 and these are the many parts of who I am. I only have one life. I, I know people are like, well, what do you do in your personal life? And what do you do in your professional life? And I'm like, well, I only have one life. I'm not, I don't, I don't have two lives. I only have one. And I take me with me wherever I go. And so where I am today in my life is just, it's just the, the natural progression of all these links in the chain that, that have accumulated over a lifetime of just living. And, uh, and I do think that it helped me to have experience in other things before medical school. I came into medical school older. So I, I, I do believe that that helped because I, I'd seen many things before I went to medical school. Many people who become interested in integrative medicine or what we used to call complementary and alternative medicine, I think many of them went to medical school and then found that there were things that they wanted to add to fill in gaps that they felt like weren't adequately addressed in, in their medical training. And I sort of did it the other way around. Yeah, no, I mean, I think that you're absolutely right. I think people who come, to, at least I'm speaking for myself at the fellowship where I met you and, and started my journey right. learning from you. But I mean, I think there was a sense of frustration. Um, and I think that's what we were all learning, trying to find not actually just the knowledge of other types of healing, um, but really the spirituality that comes from feeling burnt from a, from an environment that sort of didn't give back as much as you felt like you were giving. Um, where, how did you, I mean, you've been a spiritual person as, as I think your whole life and, and given your, I think, generations back. I mean, you write often on social media, you really talk about the spirituality, I think that really touches a chord with people. Um, do you feel that over the gener you know, over the decades, you've become more spiritual given what's gone through, gone on in your life and your children's lives? Like, how does that, how do you think spirit, spirituality has evolved for you? Well, it has evolved. Um, it, it, my, so it's interesting. Um, my, uh, I had two grandmothers that I was extremely close to, um, closer actually than to my own mom, um, uh, just very, very, very close to them. I, I really was very connected to them. And one of my grandmothers was um, a Sunday school teacher. And I used to help her teach Sunday school during the summers when I would go stay with her. And when I got into martial arts, um, I, uh, you know, as a late teen, um, I was, I was really intrigued by Eastern philosophy. I mean, I'd never even really heard of Buddhism before. I mean, it's like that wasn't part of the common vernacular in the 70s. And I was really intrigued by it. The, you know, the Tao Te Ching and, and, and you know, just the, all of this amazing way of thinking that I'd never thought before. And I remember I came home to visit and we were sitting at our kitchen table and I said, you know, Grandma, like I'm I'm doing, you know, this martial arts and it's like self-defense and plus like self-defense plus. And I said, and I'm learning about Buddhism and I f I'm so fascinated by it. And I said, um, you know, I kind of reached out to hold her hand and I said, is that okay with you? Cause she was a pretty devout Christian. Um, she was a uh -huh. Methodist. She was pretty devout. And, uh, I said, is, is that okay with you? Because I never would want to hurt her in any kind of way. Right. And my grandmother looked right at me, took my hand back and she goes, honey, all I would ask is that in your life, that you make your world bigger, not smaller, that you add things to your life and not just spend your life trying to take away things. And 
I thought about that a lot, about making my world bigger. It's a very interesting metaphor because I think that that's been a lot of my life is making my world bigger. Not saying, oh, I reject all of this. The things that I've let behind that don't really suit me anymore, I hope that I have actively tried to let them go with love and gratitude for whatever they gave me or brought me. Right. And that I've tried to make my world bigger. Um, Rather, that was through spirit or through um, thinking more broadly about healing or thinking more broadly about the earth, that I've tried to make it bigger, my world bigger, and not just make it smaller, smaller, smaller. And that was good advice from her. And so I think that my, you know, I think that when I had cancer, uh, when I had the cancer diagnosis in 2013, um, you know, and it was very advanced when they found it, uh, I think that I think that that cancer cracked me open even more. Right. Um, and and, you know, it was a very dark place. That's a very dark place when you're really, really, really sick. And when, you know, somebody says that you're you know, that you're not likely to live more than a year. Um, I was very concerned for my family and how they were going to uh, be without me and 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 all the things that sort of go through your mind and so there was a bit of darkness and finally finally when the darkness was able to just sort of when I was able to just sit with it then the light began to enter and and that has been a truth for me most of my life that whenever there's um whenever there's darkness that sort of sets in the more I can get comfortable with it, the more light appears. And, huh. um, and so I do think it cracked me open that I think I was, I've always had a spiritual nature, always felt connected to something beyond myself. But I think the cancer made me softer. I think it made me, I think it made me softer. And uh, I think it even deepened my, deepened my understanding of suffering, d- right. deepened my understanding of suffering. And, um, and, and that's something I think that, you know, all healers, all healers touch suffering all the time. I think what happens, you mentioned this earlier about when you came to the fellowship. I think that many clinicians that touch suffering all the time have never been taught how to deal with their own, how to deal with their own suffering. Um, because it's it's hard to be in the in the in the role of helping people ease their suffering and then never be taught how how do I handle my own suffering as I'm moving through this journey so right it becomes your role to heal others but no one ever really teaches us how to do that for ourselves and that's any any person who who touches other people? I, my patients who are social workers, my patients who are in any kind of healing or helping profession, I feel that they absorb the pain of others. Um, and you, if you're that kind of person, it breaks you down um, and sort of pushes yourself aside. So maybe that's why we're seeing such a high burnout rate, especially with COVID. I mean, obviously before then, but but I think that COVID yes. sort of really shined a light onto that. But, you know, certainly a diagnosis of cancer will do it for you, I think, if, if you know, um, <laughs> among yeah. other things. Yeah. Um, and, and you, I mean, look, that was 2013. You know, you've had what I consider, um, you know, superpowers with the knowledge that you know from the books you've written on plants and healing. And, you know, what's your, how do you, um, I'm not sure if I can answer, ask this question properly, but. How do you feel that all of that, I mean, I even have your books in front of me. I have this national, I'm going to hold it up just because it's incredible. But this, this, <laughs> you know, it's just the, the, the work that you do with plants and, and, you know, what you've discovered, how does that play into your healing from a diagnosis like that? I mean, you, I feel like if there's anyone who knows anything, it's you who has sort of the keys, the, the magic keys to the kingdom in terms of what the earth has for healing humans. So the question yeah. I have is, is sort of what, what have you, and what have you pulled into your life that you feel has been so important over these last almost decade? Well, I, um, I live in a very healing place. So I live deep in the mountains of Northern New Mexico. I'm deep in the forest, actually, we're, we're an hour to get groceries. So we're, wow. we're quite remote. And, um, 
and and this place is very healing to me um it's it's very it's very it's very healing to me and so you know i spend a lot of time out walking in the forest and um i know all the i know everything that grows here uh well every now and then something comes in and i'm like well that's never been here before it came with the rains it came with the floods that came through um because it floods here when it rains heavy um but i definitely think that for me there was no magic key there was no magic answer um it was surrender and people have a difficult time with that word um with surrender and so basically what it meant was for me with the cancer everybody was like you have to fight you have to fight you know fight um and i really didn't want to fight i really wanted to surrender and it didn't mean i wanted to die it meant that i didn't want to fight a part of myself huh. the cancer was me the cancer was in me and it was my cells and it were things that that had grown uncontrolled and i always talked about it like almost like a person like the cancer it had a the in front of it the cancer mm. Whenever I would write in my journal, it had a capital C. And she had a personality and she was a teacher. And this was hard. It was hard for my family who, um, who weren't quite sure what they thought about what, uh, because surrender has this thing of like you're giving up, which is not what surrender means to me. Surrender just meant that I wasn't going to actively fight it, but that I was going to dance with it, dance with her. And I actually think that if there was anything that, that helped me that was probably the biggest thing was to not feel like i was at war with my body or that i was fighting my body but that i was simply surrendering i got the chemo and the radiation i did a lot of chemotherapy a lot of radiation um i believe those were very curative to me even though with stage four they always just say i'm palliative because they say you know you're never cured of it which right. is an interesting thing in itself that you know you can be in clinical remission for years but um, every appointment just has, you know, that, that I'm, that I'm in clinical remission, but that, you know, you're not cured that one day it'll come back. So that's also an interesting shadow to live with, to tell somebody that right. it's almost like a medical hexing that we talk sure. about, but, but I, I would just say that, um, you know, everybody's like, are you taking this? Are you taking that? Are you doing this? Are you becoming a vegan? Are you, you know, and I, and, and, and I was just like, no, no, I'm, I'm doing pretty much what I've always done. Um, just going maybe deeper. I've always had a good diet. You got to remember, Ali, this, like when I was, when they diagnosed me, I, I was, um, I was extremely active. Uh, I'd been traveling. The only reason I even went in was because I tripped over my dog and I thought I broke my tailbone and it was really painful uh. to walk. So after a few weeks I went in and when they did the scan, they actually then said, Hey, Tironi, we need to, I mean, I went to school with most of these people. So they, we all know each other at the hospital here. It was like, you know, we need to, we need to, we need to look into this. And then, you know, so it went from there. But for me, um, you know, it was a great opportunity for, I would not want that teacher again. I mean, right. you know, I, I would, I wouldn't have chose that teacher. That's just ridiculous. I would not have wanted to have to go through that. But since that is what I had, I really leaned into her as much as I could, you know, it was like, um, you know, just, just letting myself be cracked open in that kind of way, made my heart very big, made me, uh, made me very loving to myself, made, made me, made, made me more gentle to myself. Um, my daughter was here once and, and the radiation had become very intense and, um, it was very hard to urinate. It felt like glass. It just felt like just glass. And I would cry. And she was laying on my bed and she said, when I came back in, I was laying down, I was kind of crying a little bit. And she, she said, wow, mom. She said, so like, I heard you talking to yourself. And I said, you did, what was I saying? And she said, well, you were just saying, it's okay, baby. You're okay, sweetheart. It's okay. It's going to pass right. very soon. It's not going to last. It's going to pass very soon. She said, it's almost so you were like soothing her. you were muttering. It was like, just, it was very, it was very interesting. It was just, it was very interesting. So, you know, I think that um, for me now, that just made me, um, made me a, a better healer in some ways through going through that journey. I, I understand things a bit more now. I share with people when they share with me, um, when it's appropriate. 
Um, but mm -hmm. I think that my own vulnerability makes me trust makes me trustworthy from my patients. I, I absolutely feel the same way. I, I, I feel like we put a white coat on and I don't wear a white coat. Um, I feel like we put on a wall between us and we it was structured that way for God, you know, hundreds of years. But the idea of connecting on such a human level with people that are, you know, going through similar things when it's appropriate to share those. I think that's the the human spirit connecting at the finest level, you know, and not creating a you do this, I'm the authority type of relationship. I mean, um, is it ideal in 15 minute appointments for regular medicine? Maybe not so much, but when you have a certain type of setup where you can have that experience and talk it through. But um, yeah, I, I have mean, that in a 15 minute visit. I do. You do. Yeah, a skill no, set. Well, yes, I guess but, I mean, it was always sets. so funny. It was always so funny. Well, maybe 20, 20 minutes, but, but, um, <laughs> I always thought it was so funny because it was like, well, you know, I don't really need an hour. I only need a few minutes, right. really. Um, every time before I go in to see a patient, because we always have to wash our hands between patients, right? So you're, right. you know, you go over and I'm washing my hands and uh, and, and not every time because I'm not perfect, but I'd say 90% of the time, I it's just a part of who I am. I wash my hands and as I'm washing them, I'm like, you know, let me bring all of my experience, all of my knowledge, all of my compassion, all of my love, all of my heart into this next experience with this person, knowing that they may not accept what I have to say, knowing that they may not want what I recommend, and that that's all, it's all okay. Because for me, it's like, Knowing that I'm bringing everything I have to every single visit is powerful for me. It keeps me from getting tired. Mm -hmm. And also recognizing that it doesn't matter if this person, you know, doesn't want to hear what I have to say or doesn't want to do what I, I might recommend. It, that it, My love and my compassion and my care is not conditional upon their accepting what I have to offer. Mm -hmm. And sometimes... It's very important for me when I say that to also say, because I, I cannot cure death. I cannot cure most really severe illness. I just have to show up with whatever I have. That we never learned in medical school. That we didn't learn in medical school. I learned that actually from a chaplain. And I think that... Um, if we could have had more of that kind of training, we'd have a different relationship with our patients. We'd have a, you know, we'd have a different way of being. And, and mm -hmm. it's been so hard this last couple of years, so hard when, when people are like, well, I think if they're not vaccinated for COVID, we should just let them die. I mean, or or, or yeah, I mean, there were things that I was really surprised to hear, even though we were we were overwhelmed with what was happening with COVID. Um, everybody, teachers, grocery store clerks, everybody was overwhelmed with with it, including the medical profession. But for me, I thought, wow, I would never, I would never not care for somebody because they didn't do something that I thought they should do. That's not a part of who I am, at all. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I get that with rheumatology patients who don't want to take medicines. And, you know, part yeah. of the battle is meeting people where it's not a battle, but I mean, part of trying to get them well is also to give them the other side of the story, you know, to give them that. I mean, it, you, you know, you you exemplify integrative medicine and how you described how you handled your cancer. I mean, which is what you teach us and what you've been teaching for decades. But you taking on that role for yourself, you. You allowed Western medicine in and you allowed spiritual and you allowed, you know, um, I'm sure herbal and supplements and, and mm -hmm. the things that you knew were evidence based and appropriate and not work, not working against the chemo, which is something that plays a role. So I think that that living what you actually teach is God, it must be just like, um, you know, pretty remarkable when it's personal. So, um, wow. Thanks for sharing that. That's really valuable to me. Um, you know, you've had a hand in, I was trying to think about your career, you know, as in preparation, and I see sort of this, you know, you, you have the, you know, the academic side, which is just so unbelievably strong. 
Um, you have this political side of you that gets involved in sort of the weeds of, you know, working with, you know, President Bill Clinton, and you served on the White House Commission um, of Complementary and Alternative Medicine, um, and even did more beyond that with the National Institutes of Health. So, um, you know, I guess one aspect is of this question is, you know, you've been doing, you've been involved in academics, you're a teacher. Um, you're also involved in the politics. What, where do you think your heart has it changed in terms of your fight for these changes in sort of medicine and politics uh, and allowing in an integrative approach into our current medical system? Or do you feel more comfortable in an education role? Since you, you take on so many roles and you do them so well, the question is really where do you feel your heart lies and is that fluid depending on where you are? Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't see them as really separate. Um, they're just all, you know, whatever is called upon at that time mm -hmm. to whatever's required. So responsibility once told me was the ability to respond to a situation. What is your ability to respond to a given situation? And that's your responsibility. And so I feel that my responsibility has been just when called upon, um, especially in politics, when called upon just to just to serve. I do take that work very seriously. That White House commission, you know, was during 9-11. 9-11 happened. Um, we were appointed in 2000. And then our, our panel had two years to travel the country every four to six weeks and listen to people and, and, and to listen to stakeholders. And it was a big process. But 9-11 happened right in the middle of it. So it was a it was quite a process. And I had to be very aware of my own bias. You know, I had a bias that's coming in. Um, I'm, I, I, I did massage therapy. I, you know, I studied midwifery and martial arts and I had an herbal company. And um, so I had a bias. And that was a very interesting time for me was to um, be constantly aware of my bias. Because when you're trying to make a recommendation on behalf of the American people, that doesn't mean people that think the way you do, but it means all the people. And so right. what are the recommendations we're making? And, and am I being true to this or am I, am I letting my biases come in? We all have bias. Any scientist knows that we bring bias into any sort of thing that we do. That's not the problem. The problem is when you don't, when you don't recognize your bias or you don't right. try to account for it. But right. I have loved, I have loved working a, a lot of the panels at the National Institutes of Health and and um, National Cancer Institute and and the White House and um, Bright Futures um, for Women and Kids. So much of that work felt so like a giving back. Mm -hmm. I'm a warrior. I'm a, I'm a warrior. Um, that is, you know, that is a part of my nature. Um, but I don't think of it as a fight. I think of it simply as truth telling, um, listening mm -hmm. and truth telling. Help me understand. I want to understand your point of view. This was probably the best example of this ever. So when our daughter was homeschooled, uh, we would do these debates. Every other week, we'd have a debate. And Jim, my husband, was the referee, right? So you'd have a timed amount of time that you had to do. So we had a big basket where we put in topics. And I would put, put in a bunch and Kiara put in a bunch. So we drew one week for on abortion. And mine was that I had to argue in favor of it and hers that she had to argue against. So she was like, 14. And she says, I'm not doing this. Let's switch. And I said, well, no, that's the one you drew. And I drew this one. So you have to, you know, you have to do that one. And she goes, I am not doing that. Oh, she was just so outraged, you know, and just, oh, you know, and, and only the way a teenage girl could possibly be right. And she stormed off and everything, you know, so she came in four or five days later and she's like, I'm just not going to do it, mom. I just want you to know. And I said, well, you have to, honey, this is what you drew. And she says, no. And I said, well, honey, if you can't if you can't even look at the other side, if you can't even step into that space to look at the other side, then I'm not interested in your opinion at all. I'm not interested. You don't even have an opinion if, you, if you're not informed. When it came time for the debate, she was a great debater and she did this beautiful presentation. I also, you know, I did my presentation. And then at the end, when Jim asked her, what was that like for her? She said, wow, I guess I'd never really thought about how some people must feel about this. And I, I guess I just never really got it. 
That ability to hold competing ideas and conflicting thoughts is part of an evolved mind. And, uh, you know, and, and it was important to teach that to a young girl, but it's also important for each of us to remember that the greatest lesson in life that we'll ever take is to be able to look out at other people and say, we're all just ordinary people living ordinary lives, sometimes in very extraordinary situations. But we're all just ordinary people living ordinary lives. I say we're all just trying to survive. It's about, it's about this empathy that you can at least look at other people, even the people that are the angriest or the people that seem to be struggling the most. Sometimes their behavior may not be what it is on the surface and digging deeper. But yeah, no, that's a great example. I'm, I'm, I'm contending with that, my, my 14 year old, my 15 year old son right now with a lot of things <laughs> right now. And he's no difference in gender. There's the same reaction. Let me tell you about that. So we're battling that out. Um, but nowadays, of course, you know, Kara's a little older. I mean, we have YouTube yeah. and, you know, Instagram. I mean, it's just like battling those, those media, you know, um, inputs is just really difficult. And, you know, it's, it's even harder, I think, possibly to be a parent with all of those other influences hitting your child and trying to influence yeah. their thought process. So, yeah, um, but really great that. example. Great example. Maybe we'll try that in my house and see how it goes. Um, although I'll be probably drinking a beer at the same time. Um, so anything to calm down the, the environment. But anyway, you know, you um, I have so many questions for you. I'm just I'm going through my list and I'm hoping we get to, you know, all of them. Um, what are your thoughts? And I and I had heard you do um, you'd given a, um, a Lifetime Achievement Award speech at IHS a few years back. And I even taped it. I think it was like 45 minutes long. And it talk, you talked about your history and it was just extraordinary. But you also weighed in on Western medicine. You weighed in on sort of the, the pros and cons of, you know, sort of what was going on in Western medicine. And you were really thoughtful and very opinionated, I thought, in, in, in what I agreed with. But, but certainly you were not afraid to, to hold back. And, you know, given all of the work you've done on both sides, on in Western medicine and integrative medicine and everything in between, you know, what is your what are your thoughts on where we are with healing now in a in conventional Western medicine? And where do you think this is going? Are there good things and bad? I mean, technology is interesting and that's changing rapidly. But are we still not getting to sort of the root causes of a lot of our problems? What are your, what are your thoughts? I think we need to have a bigger view, make the world bigger, not smaller. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think we yeah. need to have a bigger view. Um, so I've, I've known lots and lots of clinicians, physicians, doctors, nurse practitioners, PAs, nurses, just, you know, techs. Um, people go into this not because they're thinking they're going to make a lot of money or they're going to have a lot of fame. They go in because they generally want to help people. So I think that um, there's a lot of good we do. You know, you and I have both seen people come into an emergency room that we thought may die and then two weeks later be discharged from the hospital. Like you're, you're like, oh my gosh, you know, I've seen, I've seen, you know, trauma, sepsis, amazing things. We do amazing things with sort of acute care, right? Where I think mm -hmm. we struggle and we continue to struggle is, um, is that our model of care is 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 very rushed um we often don't have enough time to do what we need to do we reward um we really reward procedures over conversation so you know an orthopedic surgeon who did my hip replacement it was sixty four thousand dollars and i remember jim saying i wonder how much we'd have to have in clinic for you to bill sixty four thousand dollars as a primary care provider so you know, it's also set up in a way that doesn't really reward um, conversation and that primary care kind of, you know, um, angle. I think that, you know, um, we, need a, we need a different approach in medical school. We need a different approach in residency. We need to think about how do we help healers um, be healers? How do, we, how do we continue to help them understand about the importance of lifestyle, 
Um, you know, if we're working 80 hours a week and we're not taking care of ourselves, why would we think that was important for a patient? If we're not sleeping well and we're really stressed and we're on call all the time and we don't eat well, why would we think that was something important to share with a patient? And so, you know, I've often found that it's difficult to extend compassion to others when there is not compassion to self. So if I'm not really compassionate to self, it's difficult for me then to be compassionate to others. And there's a lot of things in medicine that shut down compassion, not intentionally, but it just happens over time. Mm -hmm. So I would say that, um, that Western medicine has brought a lot of good and you know, nobody can argue with that. I wouldn't. You can always tell what you value if you can imagine the next day it can being completely gone. Imagine tomorrow there's no hospitals, there's no paramedics, there's no doctors, no nurses, no techs, no medication, no medicine, no pharmaceuticals, no nothing. What would the world be like? I would say it would not be a good world. It would not. Ukraine right now with the war going on, look at everybody over there trying to provide medical care to people who desperately need it. So Western medicine in itself, in itself has a lot of good things to offer. It just needs a bigger way of thinking about the world. We need to know more about nutrition and about stress and about sleep and and about other ways of getting to the root cause of what's driving illness, which has a lot to do with behavior and lifestyle. Um, and those are tough things to, to tackle. When's the last time you tried to make a big behavioral change for yourself? It's hard. And, uh, you know, right. and, and when I see a woman who comes in and she says, I know, doc, I know, I know, my blood sugar's high, I've gained six pounds. It's like, I know, I know. And I'm like, I'm like well, tell me. You, you know, tell me what you're thinking. She goes, well, I know, I know. It's like, I'm gaining weight. I'm not taking, I'm not, I know I've got diabetes. I know I'm not really taking care of myself. I know I got it. And I just sit there and don't say anything. And then she said, name's Jane. She said, I'm just like, I'm just under so much stress right now. And I said, well, tell me about that. So she started to share her story and we're in a small town. So I knew part of the story. And then after about five minutes, which actually is a long time. If you don't interrupt somebody, five minutes is a long time to share. And then I just said, I'm so in awe of you. I'm so in awe of you, Jane. And she looked at me and she said, what? And I said, you know, you got a lot going on and you get up and bring it every day, taking care of your grandkids, you know, cleaning houses, you know, being a single grandmother. I mean, it's like you, you just bring it every day. It's okay that you've gained a little weight and it's okay that your sugars are a little off. Let's, let's step back and think about like, what do you need right now? What would be most helpful for you right now? That was an 18 minute visit from start to finish. So this is what I'm saying. It can be done, yeah. but in part, it's about how do yeah. I come alongside you? How do I come alongside you to get what's going on instead of punishing people because they gained weight and their, and their blood sugar's not right? You know, it's like, why should she right. feel like she's got to defend herself to me about that? It's like, it's her life, not mine. It's her blood sugar, not mine. I'm just there to partner with her. Yeah. I'm just there to partner. What do you need from me today? I, it's such a great way of, of looking. I mean, you know, I think even in the health and the well, not just the Western world, I think in the health and wellness world, there's a lot of patient blaming yeah. for their own symptoms yeah. in a way. Yeah. You know, you're, you're, you're told that if you don't, you know, uh, you know, live up to this incredibly strict diet, which is, you know, in every way strict from, you know, accessing it, paying for it, preparing it, you know, that you're somehow the cause of why you're not doing better or why you got the illness. And I really fight that because I don't believe in that. And I think it goes along with how do you partner with your patient to meet them where their lives are at. But a lot of the messaging is always, it's your fault if you're not feeling better. Yeah. Your fault, you got it. And mm -hmm. your fault for not managing it and tackling it and getting better on it. So it's, it's just a lot of, I think, um, so that I hear guilt in Jane. I hear, I hear guilt and almost self-blame. But, you know, the idea is that it's, it's, you can't start to move and motivate 
unless you yourself get a break and you just gave her that break. So, um, yeah, you can accomplish more in 18 minutes than just writing a prescription for medication. That is for sure. Yeah. Right? And, and, you know, I love that you raise some of the issues because if we're going to have a conversation about conventional medicine, which over prescribes, over prescribes way too many drugs, medicalizes way too many things. Um, you know, when you have a 15 year old who goes in to see the psychiatrist in Santa Fe, comes back to my practice, is now on Seroquel. I mean, and, and it's like, you know, I call and it's like, well, I think she has bipolar spectrum disorder. And I'm like, oh my gosh. And I'm feeling like I am so out of touch. Like I didn't even know there was a bipolar spectrum disorder. I thought it was, bipolar, you know. And <laughs> There's then, a thing and like that? Uh -huh. yeah. Well, what's the issue? Well, she's 15 years old and she's been sleeping with a couple boys and it's a very Catholic town and, and everybody's very, and her mom's very upset. And so now she's on a really powerful medication that I wasn't sure especially since she didn't meet the, she did not meet the diagnostic criteria for bipolar. We've now made a spectrum. Mm. The thing that people don't mm. often get is that medications tend to work really, really well for a small group of people. Like they do, they, they work really, really good for a small group of people. But what happens is we begin to expand the pool of people that we prescribe to, to where actually the risks begin to outweigh the benefits. And that's not something we talk about. So in conventional medicine, I definitely, you know, I feel like we overprescribe. I feel like we medicate even every human behavior and human feeling we medicate. Um, and right. you said something about the health and wellness community, which I would also say I have issues with. We're just gonna test you and test you and test you and find every little thing ever that could ever be. Yes. And then I'm going to give you 50, I'm going to, I'm going to give you $500 worth of supplements after a thousand dollars worth of tests that you had to pay for. Um, those kinds of things also are just another way you have to be careful. I'm not saying that there, that at times that's not appropriate. Right. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying though, is right. we run the right. same risk of being reductionist to the point of every single feeling that we have um, can be alleviated. And I actually don't think that's true. And I don't think it's good. I think part of the human experience is, is living a full life, which means pain and um, joy and, and hurt and sorrow and great love and, and enjoyment and everything in between, right? So if somebody said, mm -hmm. you know, so seven years after my cancer diagnosis, I've made it past the five years. And they said, well, you come back once a year or so and we'll do a scan. And Jim's like, oh, that's great. And I said, I'm not doing any more scans. I'm done. And that made my husband very nervous because he's like, we should catch it early. I'm like, I'm fine. In 2020, my daughter Kiara was hospitalized three times in acute respiratory failure from COVID. She was satting. Even with two liters of oxygen, we could barely get her oxygen, her O2 levels over 80%. You know, she needed four liters of oxygen to even get up to like 90%. Wow. At that same time, we were caring for my parents and I got them into hospice to try to give them more support. They were old. My mother had dementia. My father had very advanced cancer. And we became their primary care provider. Um, hospice couldn't come to the home. They would just leave things outside. Um, my father died April 15th. We were there. My husband and I were there taking care of him. Uh, then we had my mother with dementia. There was no putting her in any place. There was no assisted living and everything was closed in 2020. Um, and so we had to care for her. My son came home to help. Um, she died July or she died June 23rd. And this whole time uh, from Mother's Day until July 11th, my brother, we got into the hospital with very advanced cancer. And we were trying to care for him, but they wouldn't let anybody in. Uh, so every morning I'm FaceTiming him. It was one of our fellows at Mayo that was helping to take care of him. Um, and he died July, July 11th. And, um, you know, and I, I was sitting there sort of feeling the impact of losing everybody that I had from my birth. You know, all the people that I grew up with and, and my parents and my brother. And I thought, oh. So this is why I didn't go. Oh, so you were the only one that really, this was, this fell to you. This was your job. So you're still here. Mm. Then my husband says, please don't say that. I said, well, I think it is. And he goes, I know, honey, but then I'm afraid. I'm afraid you're going to think that. And then because they're all gone, you're, you're going to, you're going to die. 
I'm like, oh, honey. <laughs> oh, honey, I'm going to die whenever it's time for me to go. And nothing will keep me here and nothing will make me go a day sooner. Um, these are these these are the things about about medicine, about life, about the human experience is that that these things happen to us. And part of the reason part part of our whole karma for being here is just to try to make sense of it in whatever way we can and and to dance mm -hmm. with it. You know, there's this interesting movie. I don't know if you ever saw it. It's called Phenomenon with John Travolta, kind of an interesting movie. Yes. I love this. I love this buy movie. Buy my chairs. Yes. I always say to my husband, it, it, yeah, as I say to my husband, buy my chairs. Don't, don't worry about what you're buying, but know that it, it fills my heart. <laughs> if you, yeah. you know yes. what I'm talking yes. about. So yeah. there's this part in this movie, right? Where yeah. this stupid rabbit keeps eating everything in his garden. It keeps like, he keeps yeah. eating everything in his garden. And he's yeah. like, I'm, I'm burying the fence down, you know, three feet underneath the soil. I'm, you know, I'm making the bigger gate. I'm going to do everything to keep that rabbit from getting in there. And one night, like nothing works. So one night he's like, okay, I'm going to do this differently. So he goes and he sits out on the porch and he's like got the gate open and he's sitting there and he's like, I'm going to wait. And I'm going to catch that rabbit as he's trying to go in. Right. And he waits on that porch and waits on the porch. And then he sees the rabbit run out of the garden. And he realized that he'd been spending all this time trying to keep the rabbit out when everything he had done right. was keep the rabbit in. You know, I remember that right. story a lot because I've often thought about what do we do as human beings? What fences do we build to put all of this up around us, to put it all around us? And what is that? Like, what are we keeping in that we don't ever let out? What, what are we doing? Mm -hmm. What kind of fortress are we building? Mm -hmm. And I think that, I, I think that, you know, this is, this is the part that in medicine, rather you're integrative or alternative or conventional or any of the above, that the moment you stop honoring mystery, the moment you stop honoring just the mystery that is life, um, part of the magic dies, part, part of the magic dies. And, and for me, this is, this, is, this is what this journey is about. And so when, so it's like, okay, I'm gonna give you, I'm gonna give you Lexapro, or I'm gonna give you St. John's Word. But the bigger question is, what's happening? Why are you feeling the way you are? And where does that come from? And maybe I'll give you the medicine or the herb to help you not fall into the abyss, but I can't just give you a medicine or an herb and think this is suddenly going to be all better because we've tweaked your biochemicals. It's going to be like, what, what do we have to get into the belly of, right? What's, what's in there? What's in there? So that's where I think sometimes we, um, we miss the opportunity, rather we're yeah. dispensing herbs or vitamins or dispensing medication is that we don't sit back. We don't just sit back right. and um, listen and try to go a little deeper. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I, it's all, I mean, I'm sitting here about to just like have a session with you because I want to tell you, you know, you're, you're just, your persona is just so warm and, and you can see that having that warmth and leaning in and really listening to your patient is just, I think it just distinguishes you. I know for sure that distinguishes you as a clinician in terms of just the, the beauty and how big your heart is. But I, I do see that you being a teacher and having taught so many people that adore you, um, that that's a gift that you gave to people, you know, and I'm, and I really am trying to, you know, I'm not trying to just blow smoke. I really do think you should know how much of that teaching into listening to your people, to listening to your patients, your clients, what have you, um, really just changes the level of being a clinician that you are, you know? Um, and I, it makes me sad that, that there are no real, you know, the, the Western world is, it's 15 minutes and you can do it, but you also have to handle their blood pressure and their, their this and their pain medicine and this, and you have to find, fill out some forms and you have to it's a tough 15, 20, half an hour, you know, so it's just a shame that we can't go back to medical school and again, give those quick tools that are really so important to, 
to add into the medicinals and all sort of the, um, you know, the algorithm, the classic algorithm. We're not machines. So, you know, yeah. those kind of um, relative yeah. value units, you know, these RVUs, all these kind of things, you know, all of those things are great if right. it's like widgets in a factory. Humans are not widgets right. in a factory. So it's like, how many patients did you see? How much billables did you have? All of those kinds of things, which happen a lot in, in a yeah. Western medical system, um, they... Mm -hmm. um, they dehumanize in many ways the clinician as well as the person who's seeking that partnership. And so these are some of the areas right. that will have to be refined. And I'm not saying that every visit needs to be an hour and a half or two hours. I wouldn't even know what to say to some of my patients for two hours. Most of my guys, most of the men mm -hmm. would be like, uh, it's 20 minutes. Aren't we done? I got to get back to the farm. I got to get back on the tractor. Um, you right. know, they're going to start itching and, and having like, hives. What are you doing? Yeah. Some of my women might really like that. But, um, yeah. and again, I'm, yeah. I, I don't mean yeah. to gender stereotype. It's just in general, many yeah. of the women I see sure. want a conversation. They want a conversation about it. And a right. lot of the guys I see are kind of like, I want a conversation, but then like, give me, what do I do? Like, what do I do? And then, right. And then yeah. they go and do it, right? Yeah. Or don't and don't come back. But um, but but it, right. it it is an interesting one, and and I think that for us, a part of this would be just better teams that we could have, um, where dietitians would play a yeah. stronger role in our team. Um, you know, nutritionists, functional nutrition. You know, really being able to have people that are really um, able to support us in in helping with that part of the lifestyle, having more. Right. Masters in social workers, right. more psychologists, um, be available and accessible. I just read this morning about the suicide rate up at an army base up in Alaska, which is like off the charts. And they were hmm. talking about how people were coming in clearly in, in, in distress and being told it would be two months yeah. before they could talk to a psychologist. And so, and I've had this with patients, they're like, you know, where I'm really trying to refer them in and it's like, uh, that'll be four weeks. And I'm sort of like, well, it can't wait four weeks. <laughs> so, you know, I do think that right. there are ways in Sorry. which we could also have, we can have better teams so that we can work together um, because yeah. the one clinician yeah. can't be yeah. everything. We just can't. It's it's we need teams of people that can be supportive yeah. of that. Yeah, I think you're right. I think being able to sort of, you know, you know, I would say not so much physician extenders, but people who are qualified yes. in their own right to do yes. their own quality. Yes. Uh, nutrition yes. and, and, and you know, I have an acupuncturist yes. here who I love yes. and I, you know, and uh, right, Reiki yes. and, you know, anything that people want to try to sort of help work to 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 continue right. their healing, even if it is including medication. Yes. So all, all that would be phenomenal. So um, let's turn it around a little bit and just get into some more fun stuff. Okay. Tell me your top five herbs and you know, nutrients or I would say herbs, because I know you love your herbs and I have a little card with your herbs, but tell me stuff that you love in terms of, you know, I know you love lemon balm and tell us, tell us a little, just give me some fun stuff about the top five herbs. I, I would say 10, but it'd take so, too long. So, so. Um, that's like asking which of my two children is my favorite one. They're hard because I, I love my babies. I love, I, I love all of my that. herbs. So, um, yeah. and I grow more than 60 of them out here in my own garden. I have a big medicinal herb garden. I, so you mentioned Melissa or lemon balm. I do love lemon balm. I love lemon balm. It's a delightful tea. It's a member of the mint family. It's so good for soothing tummies. We've studied it in four and six week old babies. It helps with colic. It relaxes the digestive gut. So a lot of people with IBS and a lot of uh, people who have sort of sensitive guts, lemon balm can be very good. Um, and it doesn't have the menthol like mint does. So you don't have to worry about the heartburn problem, but you get a lot of that relaxation um, of the gut. It's also, um, its old name used to be called the gladdening herb because it made people happy. And there, there is pretty good data looking at lemon balm um, at its ability to reduce anxiety, to ease sort of that that sort of anxiousness mm. that we feel. And it's great for kids. So you've got a you know you've got a twelve year old who maybe is struggling and having a hard time, and you know you just have a, you, you want to use something with them. Lemon balm is very nice, easy to grow too. So I do, I do love it. I do love lemon balm. I was going to say, how do you how do you give it to a kid if they can't swallow capsules? Jeez. For instance, That's how, it, how, how do you prepare oh, just lemon as, balm? Just as a tea, just as an infusion. And you can actually buy like traditional medicinals okay. makes these nice organic lemon balm tea bags that are medicinal strength. 
So they're they're medicinal strength tea bags. So you okay. can just make that, but it's quite nice. Um, and if, and if you grow it, it tastes really different when it's fresh. It's so delightful when it's fresh. Hmm. Um, but I used to, you know, I used hmm. to do lemon balm, um, make a strong tea out of it and pour it into the ice cube trays. And then I would give it to the kids, take it myself, but then I would put the ice cubes in their water. And then as it melted, the lemon balm tea would just come into the water. So they would just be getting it kind of, you know, in several, especially huh. when it's hot outside. So a lot of ways to do it. Um, Chamomile, I used to do that same trick, but I would do it for teething babies. So you'd take it and tie it in a big handkerchief and let them just kind of gnaw on the chamomile um, ice cubes so they get the chamomile uh-huh. in that. I really like um, I really like ashwagandha. Um, I find ashwagandha, um, which grows from sort of India all the way down into East Africa, and it's used in, in all of that, all through the Middle East, all the way down into Eastern Africa where we go. Um, you can find ashwagandha. And it's a very interesting plant in that the roots have been used for a very long time to um, enhance memory, to create a sense of calm, um, to to um, ease sort of tension and anxiety. And we have five studies now looking at it for sleep. Not that it makes you fall asleep that night, but when it's taken over a period of several weeks, even in people who don't have sleep problems, it improves sleep, meaning that they wake up less, uh, that they that they sleep longer. Um, there's some data on it for thyroid. Mm. Um, I, I wouldn't oversell that, but for people who may have some borderline thyroid, it may right. have some effect on, on improving thyroid function. But on the other hand, I've had a lot of people with thyroid issues that I've chased their thyroid thinking it may do something and it never has. So, um, but, but there is some data to suggest that mm-hmm. I mostly look at it as an adaptogen and herb that is for people that are wired and tired and really stressed, meaning, I am just, I'm going all day. I'm just so wound up, but I'm exhausted by five o'clock. I'm even more tired at eight o'clock. And at 9.30, I lay down, just please let me sleep. And my my eyes pop open, I'm wide awake and I can't sleep. That's kind of the ashwagandha person, if you right. want to just put it so gently or, or you know, in that yeah. kind of way. Um, and that's because of its effects on cortisol, the way that it works on our stress hormones. So I really like, I really like ashwagandha. Any downsides? Well, to Other than the, we don't, uh, I don't recommend it for pregnant or breastfeeding women. I don't recommend much for pregnancy and breastfeeding women, um, as far as herbs go. Mm-hmm. Um, and for those that have perhaps um, that are taking a medication, to men to suppress their testosterone, I would say that ashwagandha may be contraindicated for you. And that's because not in women, but in men, there's some data showing that it does it does enhance um, testosterone production. Um, if that shows to be true, mm. that may not be something a man that has prostate cancer would want to take, for instance, right? So other than that, the profiles on ashwagandha are pretty, are, are pretty good for safety um, from, from a safety perspective. Um, on the other hand, then, um, I, I, really, I really do like ginger. I use a lot of ginger and turmeric. I sort of think of them, they're cousins. They're in the same big family. I love ginger. Do you know now that the American College of OBGYN and their practice guidelines for nausea and vomiting of pregnancy, like really bad morning sickness, first two Mm -hmm. recommendations, number one, take off prenatal and put on just folic acid, give 250 milligrams of dried ginger four times a day. Those are the practice guidelines from ACOG. That is pretty amazing. Ginger is a wonderful antiemetic. It's a wonderful prokinetic, meaning that it helps move food through the digestive tract. So very, very good for people who gasp, blow, feel full too easy. It also can be used for migraines. You can use it with migraine medication as well as on its own. Mm -hmm. Study that showed in an emergency room giving people ketoprofen, uh, giving them an analgesic by IV and giving them either ginger or placebo. So they gave them one or the other. Everybody got the same analgesic, but in the group that got the ginger, they had much quicker mm-hmm. uh, pain relief. The nausea, and, uh, the nausea and vomiting disappeared really quickly, um, and they had a much better response than the group that got the same analgesic plus placebo. So ginger is wonderful for migraine, for morning sickness, for digestive problems, menstrual cramps, one of the best things you'll find for menstrual cramps for teenagers. So I love ginger. And then turmeric, I'm pretty intrigued with mm. um, for you know, for a variety of things, but mostly, mostly it's impact inside the gut. It, it, it makes 
the gut less mm -hmm. permeable, meaning that it's less leaky, um, which reduces inflammation in the body in general. Um, it also has a very favorable effect on the gut microbiota, so all of the good bugs that live in there, which makes, you know, we had a, a review that came out in 2019 from Tufts, Tufts researchers, that actually looked at all the studies and said that curcumin mm -hmm. or turmeric, the active compounds in turmeric, um, that they right. actually should be recommended or considered as an adjuvant treatment for osteoarthritis because of its effectiveness and its safety profile. So I feel like turmeric's another one of those great yeah. ones. But the way I think about it is that, you know, everybody's debating how absorption, you know, what's the absorption? Do you need to take it with fat? Do you need to take it with black right. pepper? And I think a lot of Lo Lopresti's work, pepper, yeah. uh, some of the most recent work on turmeric is that a lot of its benefit is actually happening in the gut. How well it's absorbed may not be that important. Most of its benefit may be coming because it, of right. its profound healing in the gut. So anyway, those are a few. I, I love lots of them. It just depends upon, you know, yeah. what we're talking about. Yeah, you lit up when I said that, yeah. you kind of like, started to glow and I thought, oh, I, I, I love, got I love it. I my got this is a good one. I love my plants. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's like marshmallow. Yeah. And of course, you know, these things seem to really, yeah. I oh, love marshmallow I root love for marshmallow bellies. root. And it's just amazing how many people with heartburn or sore throats or reflux, anything like that, that you need something just like instantaneous. Yeah. Marshmallow is just like wow. Yeah. It's just amazing. I grow I grow a lot of marshmallow. Yeah. And of course I you know, I keep harvesting it because when it's young, I cook it just like like any green that you would cook. It's edible. The, it's an edible plant. I mean, so it's like uh, we cook it up um, in uh, the in the springtime. So, but anyway, I love marshmallow, and and that's one people should know for sore throats, irritation, you know, periodic reflux, things like that. Very very healing. Yeah. Wonderful. And you post beautiful posts, like where you'll talk about an herb and then you'll kind of, you know, on Facebook and, and Instagram, you'll, you'll, you'll talk about the pros and the cons and how you use it. And it's, it's really, really remarkably helpful, I think, for everyone on a day to day basis. But what, what do you think? What do you think about the sort of the adulteration yeah. of some of these herbs? Yeah, I, I think absolutely. it's worth mentioning because it's become actually where I live in New Jersey. Um, the teachers complained that some of the kids were having some learning disabilities. I heard this from the pediatricians, and they said that because it's a very, very large population of Southeast Asian, Indian, Pakistan, um, you know, communities that there apparently was a lot of heavy metals in these kids, and they were tested because of the community. And it's pretty shocking because the like, parents don't know better. It's spices in their food, and you yeah. know, it's not supplements. It's really for them yeah. supplements. And well, food. so what are I've your I've been thoughts? on the USP. United States Pharmacopeia for 22 years now. So we set quality standards and my job is to yeah. review um, adverse event reports. So um, you cannot talk about the safety of a plant at all if you don't talk about quality because safety has no meaning. If it's an adulterated product means that um, it, right. it contains something that it's not supposed to contain. Uh, and that is a that is a problem, um, and it's not unique to it's not unique to plants. We see this with fish and the and the seafood. A lot of it's not what it claims to be. I mean, it's it's supply yeah. chain issues. Um, you've got to stick with good companies that have really rigorous um, quality control, and um, and and you know, I, I I will tell you, I just presented at the ICSB, which is a uh, down in at Old Miss, and it's a uh, the big international conference on the science of botanicals, and it's regulatory, it's science, um, FDA's there, but I I mm -hmm. put up the products that are the big problems, and I will tell you, in the supplement space, in the supplement space, it's mostly products that are for weight loss, products that are for body enhancement and for huh. sexual enhancement. Um, and I just showed the most recent mm. FDA because, you know, they're taking products and testing them. And they're all they're all from those three categories. They're sold on Amazon and on Walmart.com. So these are products that people can get, but they do fall into these three categories by and large. So, you know, stuff that you're getting at mm. Whole Foods or that you're getting at, um, you know, a, a natural grocers or, or that. Uh, or that you're buying at Costco right. or Sam's Club, the, those companies have very mm -hmm. rigorous supply chain um, questionnaires and that in place. So I'd feel comfortable buying those, but you really do want to watch uh, any of those categories I just mentioned, you, you want to be careful of. And products made in India and in China or plants from India and China 
good companies test all those products here. Right. They're all tested. They are required to test them. Those right. are good companies. Companies that aren't, that are more fly yeah. by night country, com uh, yeah. companies, they don't do that testing. And, right. um, and you know, you don't want to be getting mercury, right. lead, arsenic, and things like that. But I all, I, I, and they put that in. I mean, just they put it in to double the weight. I mean, I think people don't, when I learn this, my jaw drop. But basically, these countries are, are very poor, some of these areas that are growing these plants, and that they, put in those metals because by they're denser and they I, weigh I, down the product yeah. and therefore I don't you know, I don't they get think that's much truth. Um, that... I, I don't think there's a lot of truth to that. Um, we do huh. know from some areas of the world heavy metals are added for therapeutic reasons. Um, this is a lot in Tibetan medicine where they're actually okay. added to enhance the therapeutic value. Um, but a lot of times what happens is that plants are huge chelators of metals. They'll, they take them from the soil. And when you harvest them in heavily polluted areas, which a lot of these countries have heavy polluted areas, um, they're very high in the metals. You know, plants, some plants particularly will, 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 can actually be used to remove like remediation from pollutants and things because they're so good at taking them up from the ground. Um, we don't right. see a lot of intentional adulteration. Yes. Like tomatoes, tomatoes yes. in the U S yes. pull the lead from yes. lead houses, you know, paints, paint, yes. I should say houses with lead paint. If too you close plant to those tomatoes too close to the house, the, the actual plants, they, they are big. It's chelators. amazing. So it's, in, you know, yeah. that's part of nature. And that's why all companies are required to test for heavy metals. There's right. very stringent rules on that. Um, so most companies do yeah. that, but this is, um, you know, these, these are, these are issues. Companies, companies that are re responsible and there are many of them, um, Every batch is tested for heavy metals, and most are also tested for pesticides uh, and pesticide mm -hmm. residue. But this is a, you know, this is this is a, this is a huge issue. Um, and and you want to be careful with it. You want to be careful with it's it though, market. because companies that do everything right feel like they're painted with the same brush. They're like, well, then everybody just says supplements are all tainted and they're all adulterated, right. which is not the truth. Um, as somebody who right. does adverse event reports from around the world. Um, most of the companies here, you know, 80% right. plus are, 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 are doing a really good job. The products are quite clean. Yeah. And, but they're knocking off companies also that are good vetted companies that you can get online. Did you know that they're, they're copying oh the my goodness. of very good on companies On the Amazon too. and That's some of these issue. places. And I mean, Amazon. Yes, I didn't want to say names, oh, I'll but say I'll it. say it. Amazon, <laughs> you know, like, and my patients yeah. will come in and they'll show me. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, okay, we'll both get sued. But we yeah. they'll come in and they'll show me the bottle and they'll say, these yes. are the ones that I even yes. sell in my practice or yes. what have you. And they're popular brands. And they'll say, look, the expiration date's in the wrong place uh -huh. and the uh -huh. dates are smudged. Uh -huh. So you know uh -huh. it's not legit. And they got sick and I called yeah. the company. They said, we know this is happening. Well, you know, when I was at it's that like conference horrible. down at, yeah. in, at Old Miss, um, just like a week or two ago, it was interesting. They had the sports, um, they had a whole section on athletes and sports and on the, you know, and the WADA and, and what they're looking for for testing. And the amount of adulteration in these products for um, that a lot of teenage and co collegiate athletes are taking for that are all full of anabolic steroids. And you're just like, oh, my gosh, my son, yeah, yeah. my yeah. son. And, and of course, this then is. Yes, it's crazy. He wants yes. all the yes. ones that are yes. on the internet for athletes. Yes. Like I'm no, those fighting no, with him all don't the time. don't buy yeah. them from the internet. If you're going to buy them, actually go to a brick and mortar sort of yeah. place um, that that's going to right. have it. Um, yeah. Yeah. It, 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 yeah. But that was really, you sure. know, you're sitting there and you're going, why? You know, this is horrible. And then FDA was there also, you know, and yeah. they're just like, you know, it's like um, they they show up. And then you give them a letter, you go to enforce and they just disappear and then come up with a new name and just show up. It's, but, but they're all pretty much in these same categories. Yeah, yeah. Um, the, these big ones are the weight loss, the body enhancement, usually for athletes, you know, muscle uh, types of things. Is that protein? Cause this is what the athletes yeah. want. Well, there's a lot of good powders. There's, there's a lot are of you, good are you protein kind of powders. Saying? I'm talking about yeah, yeah. the fuel okay. ones that are fuel. And, you know, for muscle mass. And so okay. you take them and you're going to get more muscle mass and reduce fat. Oh, um, these often have anabolic steroids in them okay. and a lot of anti-estrogens, right? I mean, they, okay. they also use things like tamoxifen. Yeah. We had one presentation of a product 
that was tested yeah. at Old Miss because the Old Miss is the place where the products, when they think there's a, an adulteration, they're sent to Iklis Khan's lab down there. They do it all at Old Miss. And they huh. showed it. And here's the label. And here's what it had. It was here was a label with all this stuff that looked good. And then what it had? Only tamoxifen. It only contained tamoxifen. Oh my and gosh. People, well, then people are like, why well, why tamoxifen? tamoxifen? And it's like, well, because it's an anti estrogen. And you, all these guys. Well, it's an EDC. We know it's an endocrine disruptor. And all chemical. these guys that are taking sure. all this stuff to, you know, to sort of, you know, testosterone can, can go down into estrogen. These precursors to testosterone can go into estrogen. So you're trying to block that pathway. Right. But we're all sitting here going, we're sitting here going, I get what? it. Yeah. Tamoxifen, that was it. It was the only thing in the product. So this is what I'm saying. It's like there's a few categories that we know are problematic. They're sold online uh, because those right. products, the, the companies could never make it through the um, to the, the whole process of getting into like a Whole Foods or a Sam's Club, something Stores. like that. They could never get in there. Yeah. Um, but those are the three right, big categories. Right. And we tell parents That's especially, know. look, your kids may be trying to lose weight. Your kids may be trying to gain muscle mass, lose fat if they're into sport, um, sexual enhancement. All these right. are all of these have Viagra and others, you know, Cialis and other other drugs in them that are adulterated with them. And so these are the three big categories. Right. So your listeners, those are those are the ones you have to Jeez. really be thoughtful about. And then when you're buying them, make sure you're buying them from big companies that um, know what they're doing and have done it a long time that have good, good, good quality manufacturing. Right. Yeah. That is yeah. such great information. Thank you for that. Um, so I want to kind of come to a close. I wanted to ask you about your ranch, your Medicine Lodge ranch, where you've hosted so many of our colleagues, my, you know, my best friend, yeah. Suzanne, I mean, all these people, you know, and they just love going down there. It's a natural medicine academy in mm -hmm. Picos, New Mexico, yep. which is where you live, yep. right? It's at your, your ranch. So tell us a little bit about that yeah. real quick. I don't want to keep you too much longer, but I just love to know so more about it, is it for the like, audience um, as well. It is a camp for adults, <laughs> summer camp for adults. That's what most people call it when they come. Um, it is, um, <laughs> we're, we're pretty remote out here. This, uh, we're up about 7,500 feet in the mountains of northern New Mexico. We're about 15 minutes outside of Pecos, about an hour outside of um, Santa Fe. Um, we have more than, between what we grow and what grows wild out here, we have about 120 medicinal and edible plants out here. Well, more than that if you add my garden, but we have a lot of medicinal plants out here. Mm. And we have a schoolhouse, a beautiful cabin, schoolhouse, and then the ponds and the gardens are all set up around outside. So people come here and, um, mm. you know, we don't get cell service up here, um, so you don't have cell phones. We do have a phone for emergencies, but people are off their cell phones. Yeah, people are off cell phones. Yay. They're kind of off technology. Yeah. Um, we do wow. forest bathing, um, you know, going right. out and meditating out in the out in the forest. And then we do things like medicine making and, um, you know, pediatrics and botanicals and, uh, you know, as adjuvants after cancer um, treatments, women's health. You know, we do all kinds of things out here. But the whole point of it is to bring people together that are interested in going deeper, learning more um, mm. about, about integrative medicine for women, for kids. Um, there is an emphasis on the plants and on nature, but we also talk about, you know, vitamin D and, and, and probiotics and, and all the rest of it that go along with it. But I think the beauty is we have people that have been coming every year. This is their 12th summer. They'll be back again. So we have people that have been here every summer for 12 summers um, that, you know, and I'm always wow. like, you know, you could teach the class by now, kids, you know, you, and they're like, we just like to come, you know, we sit in opening circle out in the forest, out in the Aspen Meadow. Right. And, you know, it's, it's a very special place. This is a, this is the land of the Cucuye Pueblo um, that lived here before the Spaniards did. And, um, it's a very old, you know, it's a very old forest. It's a very beautiful forest. You know, the ponderosas, those big ponderosas, they begin to turn this beautiful reddish color, like orangish reddish color as they age. They start when they're about 200, 250 years, they begin to, sh their bark begins to change. And when they've reached from the bottom to the top, they're more than 500 years mm -hmm. old. And we have hundreds of these ponderosa here that are, you know, 150 feet oh, tall geez. that are orange from bottom to top. They're 500 plus year old trees. And uh, yes. 
you know, they smell like butterscotch when you go and smell them. And, and uh, we have a, we have a, we yeah. have a big cave here I think that I we go get sit there. in front of, you know, where yeah. the, where the Cucuye Pueblos, you can see from the old fires there and some of the old petroglyphs, you know, from people, you know, probably six, seven hundred years ago. But this is a very special place. We feel very honored to be able to be the caretakers for it now. But you should come sometime. You'd love it. We'd love to have you. Yeah, I I would love it. And I'll tell you something. I I, uh, I have thought often about it as soon as I can get my kids a little older and kind of getting into their places. I'm going to. But um no, I hear wonderful things about it. And of course, there's no better thing in the world than to sort of take your brain and kind of quiet it down and, and perspective, right? It's so hard to have perspective right now in terms of just where we are in, in sort of the planetary universal world. You know, it's just, you know, seeing yourself so small compared to those trees yeah. is probably pretty yeah. special. So um, anyway, I, I look forward to trying to get out there. Um, so mm -hmm. I wanted to just close up and. You know, thank you so much for yet again, a, another, you know, dose of knowledge, wisdom. Um, you know, I could listen to you all day long. And uh, I think it's just been such a pleasure to know you and to learn from you. And everyone always says, oh, you got to learn from Dr. Trona there, you know, you know, when you were there. And I said, yeah, I got to, you know, so it's been a real pleasure to to be, um, you know, part of your world. Um, Anything else you want to share with us? Any, can people reach yeah. out to you or you tell us what, what, you know, yeah. follow you, of course, you know, learn lots of beautiful things on the internet, but yeah, anything and you've left Facebook, of books, I'm so. fairly active. I just put up, I just put up Hercules. Hercules just came our first bear back out yeah. for the, for the, yes, they're all named. Yeah. <laughs> I saw actually, I watched because you always post the video of the He's bears coming in. I love it. I love it. Um, so yeah, no, I'm, I know, I'm always I know nobody really follows me for me. I know oh, they just are, so they're fun. secretly it in is... love with all the animals out here, but, um, but I would also say <laughs> the, oh, the it is fun. great joy of a teacher, the greatest joy of a teacher is to watch their students far surpass them to go far more than they went themselves. And you're an, you're an example of that. Somebody that just went so far and has done so much and gives so much. And so it, it's, that's the joy always. Um, it's why teachers will always be teachers. We're always students, but it's because then we go out and we see all of these people that we once were in relation with as teacher and student who now become the teachers. And so you're certainly one of mine. And uh, it was just my joy to be here with you today. Just my joy. Thank you. I learned how to mentor from you, you and from others like you. So it's you just go. one of those things where the gift keeps giving. So thank you for that as well. Um, listen, um, yeah. can't wait to see you again in the future, but thank you so much for sharing all of your brilliance with, um, with the smart human audience. And, yeah, uh, and I much really love. appreciate it. So be bye well. Bye.